Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us on the Manitowoc Public Library Facebook page. We are live streaming tonight with Matt Welter, who is returning to the library for uh, a second presentation. Uh, this one is called Everything Under One Inch. I'll show you the poster again. Matt will explain everything to you. I've gone through the PowerPoint myself, and it looks absolutely incredible, the photography that he has. Um, it's just amazing what he gets on the camera. And uh, so, Matt, for the people that weren't here for your original uh, presentation, the Foraging Mushrooms, uh, why don't you reintroduce yourself? Okay, my name is Matt Welter, and I've worked as a naturalist for about 30 years. I've worked with the Park Service, with the Neville Public Museum, with a bunch of area nature centers, and I just really love nature. And tonight's program will be uh, one aspect of nature that I really like, and that's, uh, why don't you go ahead and go to the PowerPoint program? All right, I will put that on directly. I actually thought you were going to be saying a little bit more, so I was oh. dilly dally. That's okay. okay. That's right. uh, but That's you're right. jumping up right there. And you know what? Let me take myself out of the picture and All just right. turn it over to you. Before I do completely, I just wanted to remind everyone uh, who is watching this evening if you have any comments or questions, just type them into the comment section on either Facebook or YouTube, and they'll get fed to us. And we'll either address them during the presentation or at the end. So let me get myself out of here and take it away, Matt. All right. And um, for those of you that I sent an invite to that's in the studio, you have to go to their Facebook page. I'm so sorry about that. Um, learning new things about technology all the time. So everything under one inch. And by the way, thanks to the Manitowoc Library for having these programs. It's great to see them. I'm sure they have a lot of different kinds of programs available at their site. Um, so everything under one inch. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, as you can see, I like little things. Um, in my favorite parts of nature, I see all sorts of things, and I will stop for the smallest little thing. Many people go out on their vacations looking for the, um, the megafauna, the, the charismatic megafauna. I like the inconspicuous microfauna little tiny things that um, pop up. And this was a little trick I learned early on when I was working at the Apostle Islands National Lakeshore, um, was that if you don't have a magnifying glass or a pocket microscope, you can always turn your binoculars around. Um, and so this is this sort of old school way of looking at something. But just to see uh, a small slug uh, moving around is just to me a marvel. Okay, next slide. And one of the things I like to do is I like to just sit down and find something. Most people, when they go on hikes, they talk about how many miles they went. I go an average of about a quarter of a mile an hour. And I'll sit down in the woods and turn over a log and I'll see what looks like a whole bunch of dirt. But to me, I like getting into that little white stuff that's down there. So let's get a little closer in on that. So go ahead, next slide. And now it's starting to look a little bit like something, maybe some cups or something like that, but I like to see how far down I can go. So go ahead and, and go um, closer. Now these are looking glass cups and looking glass cups are literally about a millimeter wide and there are hundreds of them. And if you'll just back out twice again, just so we can see what they looked like originally, there we go. <laughs> This just looked like white dust, pretty much. Um, but to me, that means that it's something alive. And fungus is one of the things that I really like. Okay, go ahead and go back to two. And there, I've actually brought some of these to my um, mushroom garden that I have in back, which is made up of little tiny things. And um, I have a collection of things. And when it rains out there, you can see me on the ground just bending down and looking for these things. And they seem to appear on the same piece of wood each time it rains a little bit. Okay, go ahead and forward a little more. Here's an even closer view of them. 
Um, when phot photographing some of these things, you can get to a certain point with your camera and, you know, the camera will tell you what's too close or what's too far. Often I find that one of the things I can do is turn on the flashlight on my camera and get a, a unique, better point of view. Sometimes it takes me 30 or 40 pictures just to get the right one. Um, I try not to spend too much time on it. If I'm spending too much time trying to get the perfect shot, I'm not seeing other things. Okay, so go ahead and go forward a little more. Um, now, another thing I like to do is to make sure that I take a perspective shot. And the perspective shot is something in which you make sure there's something to compare it to. Again, we have a rolled up leaf here with tiny little dots. And these tiny little dots are actually something. Um, this is my forefinger, by the way. Go ahead and um, go in. Actually, these are a kind of slime mold. And this slime mold forms little tiny donut-shaped things with stalks. And they usually grow on the edge of a leaf. And that's pretty amazing. Um, and I've seen them along there, but they were, absolutely minute. And just to show you how big that is, that's an aphid that's next to these things. Um, slime molds are absolutely wonderful to find after the rain. Uh, they are a kind of living creature. Um, and that means that they actually move even. Um, and I just love finding slime molds. People often thought that they were mushrooms, but actually they're more closely related to things like amoebas. Okay, next slide. Next one. Here's another kind of um, little slime mold. Looks like those aliens that might be in movies. Um, some of them have really obscure kind of looks like this, but if we go to the next one, some of them look like other things. These are fuzz cone slime molds and they are each about a millimeter to a millimeter and a half in height. And usually I find them in March under dead and decaying wood. Um, so you get a good rain in March, you can usually find them. Um, only pop, pop up for a day or two and then they're gone. Next slide. Uh, another kind of thing that you can use for perspective is something that you find in nature that always has about the same size. And if you look in the lower part of this picture, there is a hemlock needle. Um, most hemlock needles are about a centimeter long. And these cannonball slimes um, are sticky little slime molds that um, cling to, usually what I notice is kind of alginous wood. Uh, wood that has some sort of algae growing in it. And they look like little cannonballs, but they're extremely tiny. Uh, usually too, slime molds are very delicate. Um, you touch these and they just turn to slime. Next slide. Another kind of slime mold you might find is tapioca slime. And tapioca slime looks like, you know, tapioca. It's usually, kind of small. Each of these little individual pearls is less than a uh, millimeter big. And usually I don't find very large amounts of them, just a few. Um, but sometimes the, there'll be a dollop that'll be probably about a centimeter wide, at the most two centimeters wide. Uh, next slide. Sometimes you find them something you think you know what it is, and then you don't. I thought this was originally a slime mold, but one of the things that you can see in this picture is these little um, stringy things coming off of this one. And this mushroom, uh, this is a fungus. Um, if you go to the next slide, you can see it a little closer, um, is called um, Trichoderma gelatinosum, and it looks like a slime mold. I thought it was actually a tapioca slime mold, um, but it's actually these little things that grow in the eastern United States and parts of Europe. Um, and it, you know, one of the things that's interesting is finding these things, and it's just astonishing to find them. 
But I find that with the smaller the thing, the less information is usually on it. Um, you know, I can find books and books and books on bald eagles, but on this little slime mold, I might just find documentation. Still, it is really fun to find stuff like this for the first time. Next slide. Um, lichens are also kind of a fairy world that's out there. And one of my favorite things to do when I get out into an old growth area, such as the mocha pine barrens, or an old growth forest, and I find a patch of lichens and mosses like this, I just plunge my nose in there and just see whatever is living down there in these lichens. These little pixie cups are very interesting, but they have a relative that's also even more interesting. Take a to the next slide. These right here are called ladder lichens, and they grow one on top of each other, and they look kind of like some sort of fairy world or something out of Dr. Seuss. Um, but when you find them, they're really interesting to find. Lichens, as many of you may know, are half algae and half um, fungus. The fungus gives it the structure and support and growth, and the algae helps add the nutrients uh, to the lichens. Also, they collect a lot of their nutrients from the air, and so they help tell us, um, you know, how our air quality is doing. And when you find a, a, mush, a fungus like, or a, a lichen like this, you know that you're getting a lot of good air quality. Um, there is one different uh, lichen that's in the picture, if you go to the next slide, and that is the um, British soldiers. And you can find that some of these lichens have really unique colors. My favorite thing about lichens is that they have sort of a dry um, way of being and then they have a wet way of being. And when they're wet, they often get more colorful, they grow more, and it's just really interesting to see how they change um, just with a little bit of moisture. Next slide. This is a, a lichen that grows in a nice little ring. And when it's all wet, it feels kind of gelatinous and it's very flexible and pliable. But if it was a dry day and I ran my finger across this little tiny lichen, um, it would just crumble and, and flake. Um, next slide. Mosses are also something that is really interesting to take a close up look at. These small and um, very primitive plants grow close to the ground. Often, about, uh, often we like to run our hands through them. When I was growing up, I loved laying in a bed of moss, um, but they don't always look the same. This one looks like carpeting, but if we go to the next slide, you'll see that there are some mosses that look like stars. And in fact, that's what this is called, is star moss. Um, lichen, uh, mosses grow on different places depending on, you know, what, uh, they, uh, what their kind of habitat is. And for example, there is one kind of moss that I know that grows only on the base of, bases of trees. And you'll see it kind of encircling the base of the tree. Next slide. Here's something else that's interesting about mosses is these little pipettes. The pipettes are the um, flowering structures that give off the spores. Much like fungus, they give off spores and they release them at certain times. And in fact, I've been observing, uh, I've been sitting and observing some mosses and a little bit of wind will blow over it and you see the spores fly out in this sort of yellowish fine pollen. Next slide. This is a really interesting slide in that these are the pipettes from a moss, but we're looking at the very, very, very fine pores of an artist conch lichen. And if you um, take a look at them, there's just millions of them underneath them. What's interesting to me about these isn't just that the pores have an interesting structure to them. If you go to the next slide, Different mushrooms that grow on the sides of trees, usually called shelf mushrooms, have different kinds of patterns. And this is a maize gill. And you can see that it has a maze-like structure in it. And you can sit there and kind of get lost in this, this maze-like structure. 
Um, what's also interesting about this picture is that you can see that things live in this. There are spider webs in there. And I'm not completely sure, but I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty, I'm guessing that this is probably some sort of sheet web spider, a little tiny spider, extremely small, uh, that lives in places like this. And some of them even have almost like periscope-like eyes that stick out from inside so they could look over the little walls of these structures. Next slide, please. Uh, this one here is the pore surface of what's called Polyporius batius, or a black foot. Um, if you look at the bottom of the stalk, down in the lower left, you can see that there is some of the black on the base of the stalk. And I bring this one up because I was looking at some of these for years and just turning them over and enjoying the structure of them. And one day I did with my binoculars, I turned it over and looked at the pores really close and there were little tiny larvae living in each one of those little holes. It was like a fiddler crab village. There was all sorts of activity going on. There were hundreds of these things. And yet each of these pore cells is about a millimeter and a half wide at the most. So if you look even closer, you might see more than you really even expect to see. Next slide, please. Another kind of fungus that's fun to find is um, splash cups. And these little uh, structures are also called bird's nest fungus. And whenever I see a nature center or a new business put up a nature trail with lots of um, uh, wood chips in it, I think right away, okay, within the next year to three, there will probably be some splash cups in there. The structure that looks like a bird nest even includes these spore bearing cases that are little tiny pillows of spores, but they look kind of like eggs. And the way that they're designed is so that when a raindrop falls into them, uh, the, 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 the spores splash out amongst new uh, other kinds of wood in the habitat. And they, they're very sticky too. They become very sticky and they stick to the wood. Um, some of the splash cups will go ahead and be in uh, a form that is in a whole bunch of different kinds of things. But then there's other kinds of splash cups that um, go only on a single twig or a single stick, and they're very small. I've seen them being less than half a centimeter big. Next slide, please. Sometimes I'll find a mushroom that's rather large and look really deep into it. And this mushroom here is a um, coral mushroom. It's a very large coral mushroom, but when you're getting close, sometimes you get a surprise too. Even though this is a really intricate structure and would make a great um, background for your, your computer uh, or your phone, um, what I found by going closer is that this particular coral smells like black pepper. And sometimes when you're bringing those things close up, you get the smells of them. You even sometimes get the taste of it in your mouth. Okay, next slide. Oysterettes are kind of like our regular oyster mushroom, um, but they are extremely small. You can see the tip of my forefinger up in the upper right-hand corner. Um, people ask me if this is edible, and my guess is that it would be just kind of academic to see if you wanted to taste them. They're just tiny and small, but I notice that they come out uh, usually just after uh, the main oyster um, bloom that's here in Wisconsin. And it's just fun to see these tiny, tiny little mushrooms. Next. Um, some mushrooms have to start out tiny. And this mushroom can grow to be about four inches tall and two and a half inches in diameter. But there's that hemlock needle again for perspective. This is a web cap mushroom when it's first coming out and it's probably just a little over a centimeter and probably just a little under an inch in height. Um, but it's fun to find them and then come back a few days later and see how much it's grown. 
Sometimes there's not enough rain or moisture for that to happen, um, but it's still really interesting to find mushrooms this small. Next slide. Uh, one of them that's small that's in Wisconsin that I like to find are fairy caps. And fairy caps can even grow only on mosses or even on lichens. One of my favorite ones grows only on lichens on like maple trees. And it only comes out with the rain. Um, by the way, these fairy cap mushrooms are in a different kind of moss than you'd usually see. Um, and also this gray stuff that's in the upper right-hand corner is a liverwort. Uh, liverwort is a completely different creature, but it's often lumped in with mosses and lichens. Um, but it has a rooting structure to it. One of the things I like about liverworts is looking up close at it. Go ahead into the next slide. The cell structure of this liverwort looks kind of like a lizard's skin or snake skin. And each little tiny piece that's up there is just a story in itself. Next slide, please. Um, getting a little bit higher up in the plant world, um, we have what's actually here a fern. And you, most of us think of foreign ferns as being these really big things, but there are kinds of ferns in Wisconsin that are very small and diminutive. This is called a moonwort, and usually you don't have any leaf structure, or if leaf structure, just a little bit, maybe a couple of leaves that are about an inch wide and an inch long. Um, one of my favorite ones that I've always dreamed of seeing, but I haven't seen yet, is the goblin fern. And it's probably about an inch high. It comes out in October and November. And it's just a really rare thing to see. I, I wish I had a photograph of one for you. Next. One of the other things that I find interesting in the plant world is often we look for wildflowers, but we don't think about the buds and the seeds. These seeds here are from a wild violet flower. And what's interesting about this picture is that there are two forms of it. The first is the capsule that is open and the seeds are all dry. They look like little coriander seeds, but they're much smaller than that. They're each about a millimeter, a millimeter and a half in, in width. Um, next to it, however, is a pod that has, hasn't fully developed. And you can see that the seeds haven't hardened in the lower part of the pod. They're kind of translucent and white. A little more over to the right there, uh, Tim. Um, but it's like little pearls that have fallen out. Next one. Here's a violet. There are some very small violets in Wisconsin, and one of my favorite ones, not pictured here, unfortunately, is the Barrens violet that is in the Mocha Pine Barrens. And these little flowers um, attract things like flies, um, and often the scent that we enjoy is often a scent that attracts flies. Um, so you can think of a fly going in there to pollinate. Next slide, please. Um, speaking of pollination and things, these are pussy willows close up. And you can see all of the anthers and stamens inside of the pussy willow, as well as that fuzzy area around it that we really like. Um, and I like getting perspectives like these in my photographs, just because you never really think about all of this. So next slide, please. Now, this might look like a plant structure to you, but it is actually a group of fuzzy alder aphids. And these creatures are only uh, about half a centimeter big at the largest. Um, it looks like snow, but if you were to blow on this, it starts moving around. And it's just kind of weird to see snow moving around. Let's take a look at what they look like before they get all their fuzz. Go ahead. You can see that this is the early part of the spring when they're just first exuding these from their backs. And they, they suck the, the saps and sugars out of the plants and then these things come out at the other end. And um, usually they're called fuzzy alder aphids because they're on alder. 
And usually I find them just after the snow has stopped in the winter. Let's take a look at just one individual. Go ahead and, yep. There's just one fuzzy alder aphid, kind of boring actually. They, they look a lot better when they're all together clustered in a group. All right, next one. Lace bugs are interesting bugs because they, first off, they look rectangular. But also, the other thing that's interesting about them is that if you've ever seen a leaf that looks like every cell has been kind of sucked away and it looks like it's just a lacy version of the leaf that existed, this is what's doing it. This, these tiny little bugs. A lot of times the cuts and bites in leaves will kind of tell you what insect it is. And sometimes every single plant, if I notice when I'm um, finding things, um, has its own bug that likes to hang out with it. Next slide. You know, one of the things I like to do to find bugs is I go ahead and I put out a sheet, and that's what the background of this is. And I like to just kind of sweep uh, the plant foliage around it into the, the sheet, let things fall, even go away from the sheet for about 10 or 15 minutes and come back and see what's hopped onto it. And this little tiny, tiny, tiny creature, remember this is a sheet, this is the you know 500 thread count. Um, go in a little closer if you would. I still haven't figured out, but it sure looks like it's sticking its tongue out at me. <laughs> um, you know, it'd be nice to be, uh, see, use this as an emoji. Uh, however, the thing is, is that some of the things that you find out there will be perplexing. You may not figure out what it is at all. Um, there are sites such as iNaturalist that can help, but they don't always help and they don't always get it right. And especially with the little tiny things like this. Uh, I was really perplexed when I found this next thing during a collection of bugs and insects. Go ahead and hit the next one. This was the, one of the most bizarre things I've ever seen, and it's only about a centimeter big at the most. And what really threw me off is that at the top, it looks like there are a couple of wings sticking out um, from there. And what I think this is, is this is some sort of uh, lacewing larva, and it's eating some sort of fly, maybe like a, a fungus fly or a biting fly, um, like a sand fly, because this was out in the pine barrens. By the way, if you do try collecting things from, you know, shaking trees onto a, a sheet, don't forget to turn the sheet over and look on the other side, because while you were spending that 15 minutes away, creatures that are on the ground start um, collecting on the base of the sheet. And so you can find it that way too. All sorts of interesting creatures that way. Next slide, please. Sometimes when I'm looking at flowers, I find insects. Can you see the insect in this one? Let's go a little closer. Down in the lower right-hand corner at about four o'clock, um, there is a uh, what's called an assassin bug, and it's waiting there for bugs to fly in there. The leg, uh, the lower leg, is at about uh, two o'clock, and it's just amazing to see how these things blend in. There are all sorts of things that blend in. Next slide. Uh, oh, that's right. I wanted to talk a little bit about these flowers, too. Flowers, by the way, you shouldn't look at just the flower. Uh, one of the things I recommend is looking at all parts of the flower. In Japan, they have a philosophy of looking at the bud, the flower, and the fruit. And you can see that in this picture. And notice that the, the flower's stamens have this star pattern. Uh, one of the things by looking at small things I start to notice is that there are a lot of different shapes that you can find in nature that repeat over and over again, and the star is one of them. Go ahead and go to the next. This is another member of the rose family. Uh, this is a dewberry flower, and you can see that this little tiny white flower that's only about half a centimeter big, um, maybe a centimeter at the most, 
has that same star pattern in the in um, in the outer um, petals. Um, and if we notice, you know, this this flower is kind of diminutive. It grows in in dark, swampy areas. I recently found a patch of them that was extremely large. And this is our native raspberry. Um, and it tastes kind of like a strawberry and a raspberry. Next slide. But just to give you some perspective on the size of it, here's a little sweat bee um, going right into it. And next slide. And if you want to see the berry, here it is. It's a really juicy berry, but it never gets to be more than uh, probably a centimeter and a half wide, uh, but it does taste like both a strawberry and a raspberry combined. Next slide. Here's another kind of star that I like to find. If you see there, is this is from a, a plant that is one of the strangest I've ever seen in Wisconsin. It's called dotted mint. It's in the bergamot family. It has these dragon-like uh, structures that come out from the stars that are the flowers. And then it has this pink um, uh, sepals that are all around it too. And it shows sort of changes color. It smells like bergamot, but it's, it's just bizarre when you see it. And the more you look at it, the more things you find on it. Next slide. Another star that I kind of like are these seeds from Spike Nerd. Um, again, a thing that you can't see in this photograph, but if you had this handful of seeds and you rubbed them between your hands, you would find that they have a root beer-like smell. And actually, Spike Nerd is one of the three roots that was used for the original root beer recipe. Spike Nerd, Sassafras, and Sarsaparilla. Um, and Spike Nerd is closer related to Sarsaparilla. Um, but it's got that really interesting root beer scent to it. And the seeds are pretty good um, as far as the smell and taste, but you should really use the root because the seeds and the berries have this sort of compound that in, makes you kind of want to choke too, and you start kind of coughing after you've tasted that. The same with sarsaparilla. Next slide. Here's another star pattern. Uh, this is from a hawthorn. Um, flower, and these are the remaining sepals after the flower has nearly died. Um, what's interesting about this uh, is that another thing you should do when doing pictures of small things is to check out your lighting. This photograph has a lot more red in it just because I did it closer to sunset, and um, it's got that golden hour where you can get a lot of uh, vibrant colors come out if you do it an hour after the sunrise or an hour before sunset. Um, next slide. Um, this is probably one of our tinier plants here in Wisconsin. This um, is duckweed. And what's interesting about this picture, if you, you know, people look for the perfect shot, but to me, this isn't the perfect time to take the shot because this is just after the first freeze. And what duckweed does that's really interesting, and each plant that's in here is just made up of one or two leaves, That's but they kind of all cluster together. I'm sure that some of you have seen the pond near your area that's just covered in this stuff. But when it gets cold, it starts to die back and it starts to sink. And it'll um, fall all the way to the bottom of the pond and wait there for the end of the, the, the freeze. And then it floats back up to the top and starts getting chlorophyll in it um, and becomes uh, uh, the duckweed that we see again. Next slide. Um, also, those hours, you know, uh, those times of year that you can see them, you don't have to see all of this during the fall or the spring and the summer. You can see interesting tiny things in the wintertime too. These are ice crystals on the base of a dried oak leaf. Next slide, please. Even perspective, um, you can find something interesting. If you ever want to have a fun, interesting um, thing to do with photography is to go ahead and try taking pictures of bubbles going in a stream. That's what I was doing with this. One of the things you should also realize is that whenever you have something like bubbles or dew drops or drops on a spider web, 
Those things are concave mirrors. And somewhere in that mirror, you will find yourself taking a picture of um, this. And in fact, if you look about six o'clock in this one, you can see the outline of me. Um, and I was, you know, using my camera to take this picture. And I was standing far enough apart from the scene that the, the bubble actually captured it. Uh, next slide, please. Sometimes in the winter, you can even find interesting bubble. Here's a heart-shaped bubble that I found. And um, you, you can find, if you look at the bubbles and take a photograph of these in nature, you can actually go farther and farther down into the ice. Next one, please. Hearts can be one of those shapes you find everywhere. And the snow melt, I found this um, pelvis of one of the, um, I believe that it's a squirrel, um, and it had this heart shape in it. I couldn't believe it. So you don't have to look for just things. You can look for interesting um, uh, perspective as well. Next slide, please. Can you find a heart in here? These are little cups, um, and they're a kind of fungus and they grow in little clusters. Each of these little cups is probably a centimeter or less in, in big, but you know, the color of them is really beautiful and they're just wonderful to look at. Next slide, please. One of my finds that I couldn't believe after seeing it in book for a year was eyelash cups. And these things, what I never realized even after reading it, those are only a few millimeters big. And once you find one, you can find dozens of them. They usually like to go, grow on mosses in wet areas that have logs in them. And I just love looking at these things. They're called eyelash cups because around the outside edge, you can see it looks like there's eyelashes all the way around the outside edge. Very fine little cups. Next. Here's another heart that I found in some dried leaves, along with some spider eggs. Um, these little egg sacs uh, are kind of an amazing thing to find out there. Sometimes I'll go back and look for the spider guarding them, or I'll look for the spiders to come out next. And you don't always find just tarts in here. I put this slide up in front of a bunch of kindergartners once, and they all just said, look, Mickey Mouse. Um, but there are other things within this. There's the structure of the leaf. Uh, this is a prairie plant that's out there. Uh, and you can even see in the lower right-hand corner, there's a single blister from some sort of insect. It's kind of yellow there. Um, but the more you look at a leaf, the more you can see and the more you can find. Next. Sometimes you can't find the insects, but you can find evidence of the insects, such as these little bites and chews off of every pine needle. And if you look up uh, some of this stuff, you can find out what, what caused that, and sometimes you can't. Next slide, please. Here's some little creatures munching on it. These are milkweed beetles. And um, there are uh, there are about three or four different kinds of things that are commonly called um, milkweed beetles. And milkweed is a really interesting plant in that you can find a lot of things living on it. Next, you can find evidence such as insects' eggs. A lot of people look for the eggs of this caterpillar, if you go to the next slide. And, you know, monarchs, we often expect to see the really big monarchs, but you can also find tiny little monarchs that are about a centimeter big. And you can look on the same plant from day to day and see it getting larger and larger. Those uh, pink pillows that are above it are actually the flowers of the milkweed. And if you move on to that, sometimes you see a little bit of tragedy. Um, notice that not everything that's out there is, you know, just for the monarchs. There are, are a lot of things that live on milkweed. In fact, there's a small field guide that's just for milkweeds and all the bugs that live on it. Next. 
Uh, rose chafers living under the leaves, be sure to check under the leaves for things. And, and if, uh, if you haven't figured it out, this, these are actually mating at the same time. So it's not just one rose chafer, it's two. Uh, next. Leaf hoppers are amazing little things that look like uh, sometimes thorns, sometimes they look like part of the plant. Some, there's one that's over in the lower left hand corner that looks like a bitten off piece of the plant, but they can be colorful. One of the things about photographing insects or other creatures is you have to figure out how close you can get. Moths will sometimes let you get very close and other times won't. Um, and these leaf hoppers, if you get within a certain distance of them, they just spring right away. Next. Again, with the milkweed, the flowers, by the way, are small. And what amazes me about the flowers isn't just the star like pattern in the pillows, but also the star like pattern in the flowers themselves. And one of the things I found out about milkweed is that. It has a very special way of transferring its pollen. What it does is that you can see in the flowers, there's these little holes. And when the insects crawl on the flowers, their feet slip down into their holes. Then there's this sticky pollen sack at the end of it. And they'll take their leg out and try to shake it off and they can't get it off. So they keep walking and their foot again slips into another hole where it pollinates the plant. It gets, sticks to it and uh, it gets stuck in there and it starts the pollination plan process. Next slide. There's a couple of ants doing just that in this kind of milkweed plant, which I believe is a, um, a swamp milkweed, uh, which actually has the scent of cotton candy. Now just imagine what it would be like to be one of those ants while crawling around here, smelling all around you the smell of cotton candy. Next. Um, also, again, it isn't just the flower that's really interesting. The milkweed gives off these seeds, which are only a few, um, uh, maybe a half a centimeter at the most for the seed part. Um, and they're really fascinating to look at. Um, once you start exploring stuff like this, you find out other things. And for example, the inside of the dried pod is very soft for some reason. Uh, next. And sometimes it's even just finding the form here. A friend of mine liked this picture just because she said it looked like a little pipe, like a Mersham pipe. Um, so sometimes you can explore with the small things, the different kinds of art, artistic aspects of it. Next. You might also, while looking at these things, find some other living things that are quite small. Let's go a little closer with this tree frog here. Um, you tree frogs are really amazing. They have suckers on the ends of their fingers and they're able to climb up into things. Often I expect to see them in trees. I know I hear them in trees, but I don't always expect to see them in the middle of a prairie. And sometimes when I sit down in a wet prairie, like the one that's out in um, Barkhausen Nature Center, you can sit there for about five minutes and suddenly right next to you, you see one of these tree frogs. Next. They always look like little Buddhas to me, just so relaxed and serene. Next. Uh, this little frog is our smallest frog in Wisconsin. It's a spring peeper. And those are my fingers, just to give you a perspective of how small they can get. They also have one of the loudest voices of the frogs. And I've been, uh, when there's a full chorus of spring peepers, I felt like I'm going to faint, not because of just the excitement of it, but because it's so loud, it almost causes vertigo. Uh, next. And just like this too, um, this, uh, this frog is probably a spring peeper, although I'm not quite sure. But we have little toadlets that come out, little wood frogs that come out, um, and each one of them is probably the size of the end of your fingernail. Um, it's just an amazing, and whenever I see things like this, I just wonder what the world must be like for them, living in this giant world and exploring it. Next. Also, 
if you're really patient, you might be able to catch the frog giving off a little croak and its, um, its body expanding and, and doing this little croaking exercise. Um, next, one of my favorite things to find is spiders. And one of my favorite areas to find them on is things like the sides of buildings and on signs. And this one was taken out at um, the Nature Center in Brilliant, and it's on a sign. And this, the sign's lettering is probably about uh, 20, 24 point, um, but it's still a great place to find um, insects. And you can see this jumping spider, that's what this is. It leaps to catch its prey, has gotten itself a fly. Um, jumping spiders are one of my favorites just because they move like little robots, and they're one of the few spiders that can actually look up at you. Next, wolf spiders are larger in Wisconsin, but I'm not focused on just the wolf spider here. Um, what I'm looking at is that egg sac under her abdomen. About June, I start seeing wolf south spiders sunning themselves on rocks, and they'll have this thing that's about the size of a baby aspirin under them. And it's an egg sac that they carry with them. Eventually, by about July, all of a sudden the egg sac disappears. And if you look very carefully at the wolf spider, you'll see that it ba its back looks like a red raspberry. And what that red raspberry is, if you can get close enough, uh, is uh, little baby spiders living on their mother's back. And they'll go wherever she goes. And I read in one account that she's such a doting mother that if one falls off, she'll back up, go back and let it crawl back up on her. Next, um, another devoted mother is the cellar spider. And this spider can't, lives in people's homes. It originally came from Europe, and it likes to, like to live in dark areas such as caves. Um, but the thing is about the cellar spider is that egg sac that's up there in the front. This little cluster of pearls she holds in her mouth for about four weeks. And she doesn't eat until then. Almost got it there, Tim, just a little closer. There you go. Um, and this, these babies will hatch out. Um, and in fact, in my house, I let them hatch out. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Little tiny babies and their mothers. Is this, you know, like the greatest motherly scene you've ever seen? Uh, go ahead and go a little to the next one and we can see them a little closer but hundreds of them uh, living in my cellar or in my bathroom. They're just, you know, fascinating, little, tiny, uh, actual looking like their mother. Okay, next. Here's some more spiderlings that I found in, uh, in my garden. And these are little orb weaver spiders, just like at the end of Charlotte's Web. Um, Charlotte, by the way, was an orb weaver spider. Um, and she probably kind of really existed, too. Um, she wasn't talking, of course, but um, the person who uh, wrote it, E.B. White, uh, he actually was wanting to see the spiders hatch out so much that he took them with him uh, onto a conference in New York and had them sitting on his dresser. And when he came in, uh, after going down to the conference, they had already started hatching out, were already flying out the window. And that was pretty much the inspiration for the end of Charlotte's Web and the whole story for that matter. Um, but spiderlings, when you see them, it's just kind of an amazing thing. Each one is doing its own work. Um, sit with them for a little bit and just enjoy the view. Next. Um, crab spiders are usually a little bigger than this. They usually are about the width of the um, flower, and this is an echinacea flower. So this is a tiny little baby um, crab spider at the, about four o'clock. And it's just an amazing thing to think of what that would be like to be walking across uh, an echinacea flower with all of its spines and bumpiness. Um, and in fact, when I shake out uh, trees onto uh, sheets, I usually find crab spiders right away and usually baby crab spiders. Next, 
Um, this is just a little flower. You know, some of our flowers in Wisconsin, we often think of gardening and these big showy flowers, but there can be showy flowers out there that are diminutive. This is wild ginger. And I would have to say, from a close-up perspective, this only about an inch in, in width, uh, maybe even less than that uh, flower, is just an amazing thing. Um, it's also amazing that it, it flowers in the spring. And the reason why it's colored like this is to attract flies because it looks kind of like dead meat. <laughs> um, next slide, please. Another one of my favorite little flowers in Wisconsin is blue-eyed grass. It's about an inch, maybe a centimeter in diameter. And it's a member of the iris family. So you see the open flower, you see a flower to the left of it that's getting ready to open, but underneath those, you see these spent flowers. One of the things that irises do is they liquefy when they're done. And so the petals just turn into kind of a liquid, and then you can see the pod underneath. Um, there are one, two, three of them in this picture. Next. Another favorite little uh, flower of mine is this one here, which is dwarf ginseng. This uh, flower grows um, in Green Bay and a little farther north than that. And it is like a little snowball that you find that's probably about three quarters of an inch to an inch in diameter. But each one of these little parts is a flower in itself. And one of the things that I've actually seen pollinating this is mosquitoes. Um, the male mosquitoes will actually pollinate this flower. Next. Another one of my favorite little flowers is the um, elderberry flower. And part of what I love about this flower is how it smells. It's got this really creamy fragrance. But like I said, I'm not always focused on the flowers. If you go to the next slide, sometimes even before the flower comes out, you can find things like these little buds that well, this thing looks like it's a little spring that's just about to pop open and explode. And you can see in the pinkish areas, the little tiny flowers that are forming. Um, so if you're going out just to look, you might find something really interesting. Next, I throw this slide in here to just show you that you can find tiny little things, but you don't have to know what they are all the time. These two little insect eggs I found underneath the log, I have no idea what it, they are. The closest thing I can come up with is that they're beetle eggs. But you have to realize that you're not going to be able to identify everything that you find. And it's just kind of, to me, like there's, it's a good wonder out there. What is it that's out there that's having this whole life that's being born and dying underneath there that we don't know is, is going on? Next slide, please. Um, for my final slide, uh, one of the things I want to show you is, you know, I always liked thinking about the superheroes like Ant-Man and the Atom shrinking down and seeing something smaller and smaller and smaller. And smaller. These tiny little cups that are here um, like to grow on like dead mushrooms. And I thought this was a really good example of that. And uh, then I saw that the middle cup, when I brought this thing home, actually has another tiny little mushroom growing on it. And that mushroom isn't even a quarter of a millimeter big. It's right in the center. You can just barely make it out in the big cup in the middle. So as you get smaller and smaller and smaller, you may find even more fascinating things. And with that, we'll go to the last slide. It's just kind of blank. We'll open it up for questions that people may be like. Matt, again, absolutely fascinating stuff. I mean, I, I've i looked through this PowerPoint several times. I don't know, probably six times. And each time I look through it, it's just absolutely fascinating. You know that, and do you, by any chance, do you, uh, you showed me the other day when we were meeting up just to talk about it. Do you have your super fancy camera 
with you yeah. that you took the pictures of? Right here. <laughs> and I mean, that's incredible to me that that little mm -hmm. unit. And uh, where did you purchase this? Oh, I got it at Best Buy, but it's um, it's called a tough camera. And I need one because I'm dropping things all the time. But a lot of it, you know, is takes it's taking patience. It's learning how to use the macro setting on your camera. And another one is stability. Always making sure that like one point is in contact with something so that there's more stability. If you have a whole side in contact with something, there's even more stability. Um, sometimes on the back, there'll be like, different kinds of settings. One of them that I use when, especially with the small insects, is taking multiple pictures at once. And the flashlight, um, uh, rather than using a flash, using the flashlight setting really helps get all of the kind of action shots that they do and move. But, you know, I'm showing you some of these things and sometimes I get it the first time, but sometimes it takes me 20 or 30 tries. Sure. But I mean, I, I, I admire the patience. I, I mean, just, just that, you know, you can, it, it obviously requires that you have some stick to it this, that, you know, mm -hmm. you don't expect immediate results. But I mean, the results are absolutely fantastic. Um, comment, we have one so far from Nancy who says, okay, now that's just cool that slime molds move. Yeah. That, and that came early on. You can actually even kind of see this. I've found that there's this slime that's called dog vomit slime that grows in everybody's wood chips when they set it down. It looks yellow. It looks like scrambled eggs. Or they're like a dog threw up in your wood, pile, wood chip pile. And if you look at it in the early morning when it first comes up, you can see one side is high and the other side is kind of low and retracting. And you can see that that's the direction that it's moving is towards the high side. Okay. I've, I've tried, you know, taking, you know, putting sticks around it and seeing if I can see it move, you know, checking on it every hour because it moves like a millimeter an hour. <laughs> um, but the thing is, is that it usually dries up before then. So you kind of have to get up in the middle of the night, it's my theory, and, and start trying to look and see the pattern. So if anyone has any questions or comments, just type them into the comment section on either YouTube or Facebook, and they'll pop up on my screen, and I can pass them along to Matt. Um, while people are formulating uh, questions, I, I'm going to take this opportunity to just uh, promote a few other library programs that we have that uh, involve being outdoors. They, they aren't exactly the same thing, but they are both. Uh, there are two gardening programs that we have coming up on Wednesday, the 22nd of this month at 6 p.m., we have In the Late Season Garden with Amber and Dina. They've done a, a bunch of gardening shows. They're from Grow It Forward in Manitowoc. And uh, they're going to be talking about, you know, gardening isn't just for summer. You can prep and get ready for winter, and there are things that you can still push out in autumn. So that's on the 22nd at 6 p.m. on our Facebook page. And the other one is on the 27th, which is called Flower Power, Pruning Your Perennials with Jordan Cabot, um, and that is exactly what it sounds like. He's going to be giving you information on, uh, you know, um, getting your flowers ready so that they, they pop up best next season, giving info and dispelling myths. That's on Monday the 27th at 630. So uh, those are two other outdoor programs that we have coming up. Um, still checking to see if anyone has any comments, questions. Don't be shy. If you have anything, just pop them in. So you're going to be putting this program up on YouTube, too. Yes. And, well, as soon as we end, like give it uh, a minute or two, if anyone's watching and wants to pass it along to people. Um, if you go to YouTube, uh, just search Manitowoc Public Library. The URL is far too long to just give out. But just search URL and uh, just search Manitowoc Public Library, and this will be the first thing that pops up. Otherwise, uh, go to our Facebook page, the video section. This will be the first thing on there. Uh, and that will populate, oh, I'd say give it 35 seconds to 40 seconds after we wrap up, and, and it'll be on there. And it'll be on there forever. 
so yep definitely if you didn't catch this but you liked it i recommend uh you know uh passing that along to everyone because this is uh, the the photography and just the nature aspect of it is so absolutely fascinating and matt you do uh your knowledge is incredible and and, and your pictures are to me, even more incredible. The knowledge is great, but I'm just staring at the pictures and just in awe of the the micro world that we really often don't take uh, uh, notice of. Yeah, or that I, the bulk of us don't. It, it can be a real bad habit, though. I mean, you're, <laughs> you have hundreds of pictures, you know, of sure. really tiny things. And you're, you, the, like some of them, you don't get to figure out what they are. And you come back a couple of years later and you're like, oh, I know what that is now. <laughs> <laughs> it's an ongoing process. But, you know, yeah. I mean, if you love it, you love it. And uh, I think it's fantastic. So it doesn't look like anyone has any questions. Um, so. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you very much, Matt. That was a, a fantastic presentation. I absolutely loved it. Um, any final words, Matt? Just get out there. We still have lots of time for the summer. And if you can't get a camera with a macro on it, get out a magnifying glass. Or, or turn your binoculars around. Yeah, or turn your binoculars around. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, from Manitowoc Public Library, I'm Tim Kaczynski, Matt Welter joining us this evening. Have a fantastic rest of your night, everyone. Bye now. <laughs>